Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Evolving Role of Clinical Data Management, presented by Roe. I'm Joe Keenan, contributing editor to Fierce Markets, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speaker today is Derek Lawrence, Operational Service Leader, Data Management at Roe. You can read his full bio on the right side of your window. Before we begin, just a few technical notes. If you'd like to download the slide deck, please click the Resources List button at the bottom of your screen. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help button at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We will follow the presentation with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the Q&A button on the left side of your screen, and you can do that throughout the presentation. All right, I think that covers it. Derek, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Joe mentioned, my name is Derek Lawrence. I'm the Operational Service Lead for Clinical Data Management here at Roe. Um, as you've all chosen, or at least hopefully chosen of your own volition, uh, to spend some time this afternoon talking about data management, I do hope the information we present here is, is novel but not completely foreign. In most discussions about the future of specific functional areas, project management, clean ops, biostatistics, data management, the topics usually revolve around what new tools and technology are on the rise and how they're set to impact all of us in the industry. <clears throat> but before we get into the real content of the webinar, I'd like to take a step back from tools into traits. Now, no one has to you know, unmute themselves and say this out loud, uh, but I'd like everyone to grab uh, their phone or tablet or good old-fashioned piece of paper and jot down the top three to five personality traits that come to mind just from your own personal experience when I say each of the following job titles. Uh, data manager, stat programmer, and biostatistician. I'll give you all just a minute to jot those thoughts down. Okay, that probably is a sufficient amount of time, so we'll go ahead and move into the rest of the presentation. As it stands today, the data management functional area still deals primarily in paper-based manual methods of handling day-to-day -day work. Uh, we, all of us that are you know, doing data management tasks capture a significant amount of research data and operational data on paper, which is then scanned, transcribed, and simply filed away. Our primary currency is typically spreadsheets on which we do everything from specking ECRFs and edit checks to recording data issues and decisions, which are, of course, prone to deletion, corruption, loss, and have no audit trail capability. And on top of all of that, they're almost never FDA audit defensible means of documenting anything. In recent years, EDC systems have become inexorably connected to the data management role. <clears throat> if uh, any of you go and read job descriptions online for open positions in the data management field, the general flavor of almost every posting goes something like this. Develops DMP, provides specifications for EDC system and multivariate edit checks, reviews listings, open and closes queries, etc. With the massive increases in available data sources, if we were to begin designing studies using only external data sources, i.e. not EDC, we'd have to ask the question as to what performing traditional quote-unquote data management activities would even look like. Now, there's some variability in clinical research with this third bullet, but by and large, there's little to no uh, direct programming done by data managers. As connected as data management has become to EDC systems, most of the effort goes into the maintenance of the system itself, concentrating on tasks like form completion and query reconciliation. Uh, lastly, and I'd argue most importantly, the clinical research enterprise suffers pretty greatly from the prevalence of functional area silos, and I really don't use the term suffer lightly. Uh, these silos, while expediting specialized job tasks, really prevent an easy look at entire processes and hinder conversation between groups that might help spur improvements and innovation from the ground up. 
So specialization in any industry, but especially in clinical research, didn't arise out of thin air for no reason at all. And there are benefits to encouraging specialization. An employee who performs the same task repeatedly by specializing in it is less likely to make a mistake. They're familiar with the pitfalls and issues that a non-specialist performing that task wouldn't know about. Another advantage of specialization is that employees feel a certain amount of camaraderie with others in their department or skill set. It allows for that general feeling of we're all in this together that boosts morale and in turn improves performance. And even if an employee is a lone specialist in what they do, it still brings feelings of personal pride. Training one person to do a particular job saves money and time in training. Transferring or moving employees from a task they're skilled in to a task that they're not means potentially wasting a lot of resources. And so this is a virtual guarantee of not having to expend money to perform the same task over again because the specialist knows it well. However, there are some pretty big pitfalls to this approach. When employees specialize in just one aspect of a company's goal, they may not necessarily feel connected to the whole process, to say nothing of feeling disconnected to other coworkers. There's an innate satisfaction that comes from understanding an entire process from nose to tail. Specialization could lead to feelings of isolation or being divided from the whole with a decline in work ethic being the real danger here. Additionally, the risk that comes hand in hand with the benefit of intense subject matter expertise is a pretty serious degree of inflexibility. As I mentioned earlier about data management job posting and descriptions, you'll have seen the current data manager role is directly connected to EDC systems in most cases. So having an employee that heavily specializes in specking, building, and maintaining EDC systems really is a great benefit until the proportion of clinical data, which is hovering between 80 and 90% of every trial uh, you know, today, starts to decline. So as more and more trials move to more agile means of data capture, and this can be any type of capture from mining EMR and EHR systems, mobile health, biosensors, wearables, custom apps, and bring your own device trials, that heavy specialization is now a barrier to success and does increase the risk that highly specialized skill sets, and specifically in the case of data management, EDC knowledge, it increases our risk that the personnel skill sets could be rapidly outdated. Now, I'm not 100% sure everyone on this webinar will have the same experience that I have or that others have had, but I'm willing to bet that some of you have worked at some point for an organization in which you're all only allowed to be involved in tasks that have traditionally belonged to your functional area. And in some cases, your workspace was probably physically laid out the same. Biostatisticians seated together, DMs with DMs, et cetera. That structure isn't really designed to help us maintain a volume of cross-functional knowledge, and to try to fight back against that is tricky. So I'm sure you've all heard the statistic that over 90% of global data has been created in the last couple of years. Uh, data structures have evolved from simple row-by-column data sets that can be easily read by the human eye to multidimensional structures designed to effectively store vast amounts of complex data. I think the, the easy example that I use here, I, was, uh, I presented at DIA this last year with Jonathan Palmer, uh, who's, a, uh, who's an employee at Oracle. And he has a coworker that was running a study using a device, just a very nondescript looking white panel that was mounted on the wall of a home. And that device did everything from measuring breathing patterns, gait speed, sleep, and it used all of that information to help track, assess, and define the progression symptoms of neurological conditions like Alzheimer's. Well, as you can imagine, every time someone moving in a space, that data is not exactly conducive to one row meaning a time point, another row meaning another time point. This was incredibly complicated data that could not be fit into the standard row by column uh, format. So these multidimensional data structures that are designed to effectively store this kind of data cannot be reviewed manually. And manual is kind of the, uh, the name of the game for DM today. I would believe it's not any small stretch of the imagination to automatically assume everyone on this call is a regular user of at least one of the following companies or services. Uh, Amazon, Netflix, Uber, Lyft, and all of these are purveyors of narrow artificial intelligence tools and algorithms. And all of this kind of falls under the general umbrella of what we would call big data. And despite the term big data being incredibly familiar to nearly everyone in the clinical research, big data tends to remain kind of an amorphous concept. If you ask 10 people, uh, even within clinical research, not just off the street, to define what big data is, I'd wager you'd get 10 slightly different definitions. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to refer to big data as a MacGuffin, but its direct impact on the vast majority of our day-to-day -day work is very abstract. And 
And for those of you that are data managers on the call or work closely with data managers, I would assume the standard gripe for most of these kind of forward-facing presentations is this inevitably generates into a discussion about how HAL 9000, Skynet, and our future robot overlords are going to rise up and solve all the problems and inefficiencies in clinical research. So it's not that kind of presentation. We'll change direction slightly from here and try to make the content as personal as, personal as possible. I presented the SCDM, which is just the Society for Clinical Data Management, in 2017 on the rise of big data, AI, machine learning, and data source diversity, volume, and velocity, and all of the ways it was poised to change the way, in, in, uh, the way we in data management do our jobs. So at the end of this presentation, uh, the audience had a chance to participate in open discussion. And the very first question that we were asked was, this is all great information, this has been a great presentation, but when I go back to my desk, when I get home from this conference, I don't know how to do anything that you've talked about. I don't see how anything that's been part of this presentation applies to my day-to-day -day work. And that was truly a great question. And in the interest of getting our current work done, it's one we all tend to neglect in favor of tangible deadlines. So at SCDM that same year, I overheard the, follow, the following verbatim comments. I mean, this stuff's all impressive, but I'm too busy to spend time worrying about what the future's going to look like. I've got work to do now, and I'm going to do it. So I disagreed with that statement. But I did realize that I, along with the other presenters at the session, hadn't really done a good enough job bringing the conversation down to the ground level where the day-to-day -day work gets done. So we collectively kind of put our heads together, those the other folks in the session with me, and we kind of you know, quietly agreed that any time we would present on the topic in the future, we'd do our best to keep the content real and actionable. So we may not spend any more time talking about big data, but we will talk about data science. Now, if there's anything that's equally as confusing as trying to define what big data is, it's explaining what data science is and what data scientists do. And that's largely due to the fact that data science is an umbrella under which a lot of different tasks fit across a lot of different industries that have a decidedly different purpose depending on who you're talking to. And it's not that it, the concept is too complicated to explain, but data science does mean different things depending on who you're talking to. So for the purposes of the webinar, a very simple definition for data science is the study of where information comes from, what it represents. math and statistics, data analysis, data mining, and visualization. So I stole this Venn diagram from a coworker of mine who's fond of using it. And uh, humor aside, it does paint a reasonably clear picture of the components of data science. Plus, there's a you know, reference to evil, which tends to lighten up fairly dry presentations about you know, functional areas that largely work in uh, you know, tedious manual methods. So the biggest takeaway for me is the picture it paints that data science requires not really a list of skills, but also specific traits. And so if the skills that data scientists need <clears throat> involve not only stats and programming, but an ability to thoroughly sanity check the data, second guess the sources and any inferences made, clearly articulate any, articulate any insights gained, and creatively answer questions all while assembling every piece of data that you have available, no matter what the source or format, Maybe what helps make a good data scientist is comfort with confusion and ambiguity, creative problem solving, potentially extroversion and skepticism, and intellectual curiosity. Now, I'll preface this by saying it's only my opinion, but I believe that data management in its current incarnation will end up being absorbed by other functional areas, including programming and data science, and I think that's going to happen sooner rather than later. I tend to lean in this direction due to the fact that data management tasks are beginning to show the first signs of strain from attempts to combine traditional methods and approaches with recent advances in tools and data diversity, volume, and velocity. Uh, the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development put out an, a recent impact report, and that impact report dealt primarily with data management. It did an in-depth dive into cycle times, details of <clears throat> you know, what systems and data formats were in use, and all of the challenges. And they were, uh, there was a mix of sponsors and CROs that they surveyed. 
And the high-level summary boiled down to a decrease in the prevalence of EDC as the primary point of data capture for clinical trials. Now, the decrease isn't stark, meaning in four years we're not going to see the death knell of EDC and all studies will be conducted in some fashion that does not involve EDC systems. But the trend that came back was really undeniable. There was also data to support that there were an average of six applications to support each study, and that's from lab systems, personal devices, EDC itself, randomization, and the like. There were also an increase in the technical challenges experienced in dealing with data from an increased number of sources. And what I would consider most important, they had a chart in that impact report where they found that newer sources of data, and this included EMR and EHR systems, uh, custom apps, wearable devices, <clears throat> biosensors, smartphones, etc., were predicted to rise two to threefold in the next three years. And I think everybody that's been in this industry long enough, and specifically those that handle federal projects that may span multiple years, three years is nothing. And from the sound of all of that, all signs are really pointing to a major shift in how the tasks traditionally handled by data management are performed. And that shift includes more than just a list of new systems or tools that will be required to master. We're already seeing a trend in the number of companies that are posting positions like data analyst and data operations. These new roles have a much heavier technical bent and are primed to take over the larger, more complex, and in my opinion, more fun tasks associated with our functional area. So if you were to look for a data management position today, you would find the landscape remarkably similar. The job titles don't seem to be changing or the tasks associated with the job titles. However, with the rise of these data analysts, data operations, and these other ty these, you know, kind of like higher level data positions that are somewhere between data science and current data management, the tasks seem very much like high level data management. So it looks like the absorption into other areas is already beginning. So let's go back to the first part of this presentation. So if we think about the traits that we just described a slide or two ago, and take it as a very likely fact that we are destined to extract, process, and interpret data from a very wide variety of potential sources in a number of changing formats and structures. How do the notes you all jotted down about the current traits you see for those currently in data management roles mirror the aforementioned traits? So when you jotted down what you in your experience has been a personality trait that you would ascribe to a standard to a data manager today would it be comfort with confusion and ambiguity creative problem solving extroversion skepticism uh, those didn't match my notes at all so just as a as a personal side note but what i did find is that my notes against the future state very much mirrored a three-pronged approach that i found overlapped nicely with data management stat programming and biostatistics so to me, it seems like a combination of the three are what, uh, are, as far as stereotypical traits are concerned, are going to give us the best output. So in short, the future is really happening on the data management front, and it's happening right now. So getting back to the gentleman's question from SCDM, great, this is the future state. For a moment, let's not consider the future some arbitrary date months or years from now. Let's use the definition that he provided. The future is the minute this webinar ends and we all get back to our desks. So what can we all do right now? So actionable strategies now would be an emphasis on specific personality traits. At Roe, we tend to uh, refer to this as adaptability. And this, is basically bo this basically boils down to fluid, differentiated, and unorthodox thinking. So a cliche way of saying this would be perpetually thinking outside the box. What data sources do I have? How can I use them? How can I leverage these data sources to get what I need? Uh, an analytical mindset. So we're all encouraging our DMs to program, but it's not, it's not a specific programming language that really makes the difference. It's the abstract concept around data manipulation that make a good programmer, not necessarily directly following specs that you're given. There's also a need for better stats, uh, stats acumen, so an increased focus on statistical methodology. Within DM, we don't need to create full-blown biostatisticians, but working knowledge of certain statistical concepts is going to be necessary. Again, with wearable devices that may be providing a measurement every 10 seconds for weeks on end, 
those are too many data points to handle in the standard EDC CRF format where we query each data point that doesn't seem to fit. The, the fact remains is there is the volume of data is too great to handle those tasks in that method. So we're going to have to look to the adoption of new visualization tools to enable us to look for patterns among sites and individual subjects. And then when we find issues of potentially device error or attribution, how do we deal with those? And fourth, we're going to have to develop more cross-functional knowledge. All of us are going to have to be able to see the big picture and work across existing organizational silos and also autonomously. So to summarize that, we have to be more bold explorers and not passive observers. Uh, with these unprecedented increases in data source diversity, volume, and velocity, we can't depend any longer on the traditional detail-oriented meticulous nature of the average data manager today to be sufficient when dealing with this new reality in clinical research. So again, if this were a live presentation, uh, for everybody on the call, I, I'm always fighting the urge. My mother was a school teacher, and I'm always asking people to raise their hands. Um, so that doesn't work on a webinar, so I'm continuing to fight that one back. Um, but this is the point where I would ask who has heard this term. But the term citizen data scientist is relatively new, but it's one that's caught on to the point to where there are online courses and certifications for becoming, quote, unquote, a citizen data scientist. Now, with data scientists, there is no stable definition for what either data scientist or citizen data scientist is. It's more of an umbrella. But as a loose definition for purposes of the webinar, it would be a person who handles data wrangling duties, analyzes data, and creates reports and models with the help of big data tools and technologies, but has no official training as a data scientist. So the takeaway here is that the tools and technology that we have available today have reached a point where non-data scientists can perform similar functions that would have taken a skilled data scientist five to ten years ago. So I don't know how many people on the call are uh, fans of superhero movies and or comic books, but the metaphor I usually like to use with the citizen data scientist is Iron Man, Tony Stark. So when Thor wakes up in the morning, he's Thor. Lift buildings, fly through the air. Captain America wakes up, same thing, can still bench, bench press a Hyundai. When Tony Stark wakes up in the morning, he's just another guy. He has to put on the armor of his own design, and by doing that, it brings him on par with the other two. So it's not that by his nature, it's the application of new tools and technologies can really pump up what a non-data scientist is capable of in working alongside that person. So why does this make sense? So as data science is on the rise in many more industries outside of clinical research, it does make sense to consider the effects of a growing number of data science-esque positions and approaches to handling issues surrounding large, complicated data and how those are going to affect data management. And this chart shows a breakdown of what tasks currently comprise the majority of a data scientist's time. So we have building training sets, refining algorithms, and mining data for patterns, which I would say are kind of three hallmarks of a data scientist position, an official trained data scientist. But the ones that really drew my eye as someone who has all of his background in data management were cleaning and organizing data and collecting data sets. Those two items comprised almost 80% of a data scientist's time, and those tasks sound shockingly like data management tasks to me, albeit with more data coming at us faster in more complex structures. So if the vast majority of a data scientist's job is simply wrestling the data into submission with more of this coming from <clears throat> uh, a broader array of sources than just EDC, it seems like these data wrangling aspects in ETL or extract transform load are going to become more important for handling this. We can no longer depend on an EDC system to produce nice, neat, orderly row by column data sets that are functionally ready for use the second they're exported from the system. If we could develop a contingent of citizen data scientists to handle these tasks, data scientists could apply their expertise and training where it really yields the most benefit and not doing so many of what we would call, quote unquote, data managing tasks. So, what do we need? Really, we need clinical research activities conducted by specially designated, organized, trained, and equipped teams manned with selected personnel using unconventional tactics, techniques, and modes of employment. If that sounds like a very proper definition and one that you might have heard before, this is actually a paraphrased definition of the special forces, courtesy of NATO. 
So I have two friends of mine. One is a former recon marine, and one is a uh, one is an army ranger medic. And I was just you know spending time with them on vacation last year, and I overheard the two of them talking about one. Uh, they said he was the most most the, he was the fittest special ops guy they'd ever met. And I had to laugh, and they asked me why I was laughing, and I said I don't think I've ever really pictured an out of shape special ops soldier. And that's when I was course corrected slightly, and they said, well, it's not exactly, the, those that are selected for the special forces are not selected based on physical attributes alone. There's a huge portion of the recruiting process for special forces that takes into account personality traits. So <clears throat> let's explore that metaphor a bit further. So on the left side of the screen, we have traits of special forces. On the right side, we have citizen data scientists. So on average, those in the Special Forces have eight years of experience in the conventional forces before moving to Special Forces. On the Citizen Data Scientist side, with no specific functional area training, again, not being dyed in the wool in title data scientists, they've been trained in the conventional hierarchy. They understand how the work gets done from the ground up. Uh, those in Special Forces receive cultural and language training in the regions where they're deployed. And for citizen data scientists, they all have familiarity with multiple programming languages, which increases their effectiveness and ability to communicate from everyone from PM and ClinOps to those in biostatistics and data management. And everyone has a certain level of medical training, special forces. So again, this is that lack of specialization. If you have you have a team of <clears throat> you have a team of soldiers and you have one medic and that medic goes down, you are now without a medic. You have no one who can fill that specialized role. And depending on where you are in the field, that's highly dangerous. On the citizen data scientist side, this, the lack of specialization as far as not someone who is just slave to EDC tasks, it allows team members to fluidly replace each other depending on a project's needs. And special forces work alongside conventional forces and autonomously. So again, they can work in conjunction with those still working in the siloed hierarchy, or they can be set on projects that span functional areas and allowed to work alone. And citizen data scientists can do the same, work within and across project teams. And again, as we alluded to at the beginning, they're selected not only phys on physical tools, but on personality assessments as well. And we have to look at the same kind of model when we're considering who might best fit this citizen data scientist role. And we might consider that rather than skill or systems familiarity, that specific traits might actually yield better results than promotion based on current competencies, or what some folks call the ivory tower of expertise. So what is our overall goal? So the clinical research landscape is, is changing, and it's happening quickly. And machine learning, predictive analytics, and artificial intelligence are inevitably going to change the field of data management. That being said, our path forward is unclear. There is not a clear target to say what data management will look like, what the prevalence of data scientists versus citizen data scientists versus other groups is going to look like. We just don't know. But given this ambiguity, training people to respond rapidly to changes to tech and process is really our best option. So in a one-word summary, we're looking for folks who are resourceful, can use the tools and data and <clears throat> tools and data and technology they have on hand to problem solve. And piggybacking off of that, we need to place emphasis on concepts and abstract problem solving and not just tools. I'm always telling folks that the most important course I ever took in undergrad was in the philosophy department. I had a one semester long course in logic, and it was basically boiled down to metacognition. How do you solve problems given certain constraints? So clinical research is traditionally a risk-averse industry, and really for excellent reason. We're in the business of improving and prolonging the lives of our, our participants, and all care and caution need to be exercised to ensure the safety and security of our patients and their data. But individually, we can't hold ourselves back out of an abundance of caution. And uh, in my opinion, I'm sure more than one of you is familiar with Buckminster Fuller, uh, they're really wasn't, I think, a more quotable human being, and this line is particularly relevant for today's presentation. We're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. So again, being a risk-averse industry means we have traditionally waited to see 
among tools and technology and future changes in process, what was going to win out and become superior, and then we would adopt on the tail end of that. There are large companies circling clinical research, the likes of Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, and they are looking to transform our industry. They're not planning on coming into play with the same tools and technology that we have spent the last several decades constructing. So for those of us already in data management, we need to resist the urge to wait until a clear path emerges before we act. And that's going to be our greatest achievement, to make sure that we can help build a new model worthy of replacing the old one. And if we're, on, if we're to be architects, we should really get to work on a blueprint. So developing actionable strategies. The good news is that mirroring the citizen data scientist model is really immediately actionable, no matter what size, uh, no matter what size or how staffed your organization is. So the first step would be finding potential talent. And I guarantee you there are citizen data scientists working at all of your organizations right now. They just haven't been identified yet. And when hiring new staff members, consider implementing not just skill assessments, not how effectively or how much experience does anyone have with this one specific tool, but personality measures as well. How uh, they're finding, find, excuse me, finding <clears throat> measurements to identify those that are particularly good at abstract problem solving or degrees of extroversion. And then with the, tra with the identified workers, have biostatistics bio and programming personnel develop a curriculum about what statistical concepts and languages would be of maximum benefit to your organization. DM by and large today deals mostly in if there's a need for something, they write a spec, it's delivered to stat programming or biostats or another group, and then the output of that comes back over the wall. In my experience, about a third of those tasks are straightforward enough that with some baseline acumen and programming, either in SAS or uh, Python's a little bit more data scientist-y than, uh, than, than would be useful in most cases. But DM should begin handling these tasks themselves. And as far as those that are willing to self-select into this new potential uh, track, there's an amazingly robust selection of online data science and programming courses available. There's a, John Hopkins has a data science division on uh, data science course on Coursera that's particularly good. DataCamp offers a number of classes and courses online in your spare time. I know I've taken the John Hopkins data science specialization, and it's been it's been immensely useful. So the bottom line is, despite clinical research being traditionally risk averse, we can't hold ourselves back. And the bottom line is simple. At this point, and especially for data management, holding still is not an option for us anymore. Big data, artificial intelligence, full or narrow, the Internet of Things, and an ever-expanding list of tools and new tech really is the future. And it's not a far-off future at that. So if those of us in data management all hitch our wagons to develop and maintenance VDC systems and ignore the signs that our industry is rapidly expanding beyond that model, we will run out of road. Not now, maybe not in 10 years, but it will happen. The good news is we can improve our skill sets, we can look for and encourage specific traits when we hire staff based on long-term capability, and we can improve the ways in which we do our jobs. We can help facilitate the individual growth of our employees by, ask, by allowing them the opportunity to develop new skills and give them a voice in how best to fuse the old with the new. But we are going to be the ones who have to lead the charge. I can't tell you the number of times that we have been interviewing new hires that are looking for a new position because in data management because their previous employer wouldn't even install SAS on their machine. These were people that were going out and learning a programming language and then being told that they were absolutely not allowed to use it despite any efficiencies that might gain to the organization. And so in a way, we're all holding ourselves back when we engage in those kind of self-limiting activities. But all of this can be done, and it's definitely not outside the realm of possibility that we can move whole divisions of data management into these new citizen data scientist roles. And there's really no time like the present. So I know we probably wrapped up a little bit early. Uh, just wanted to thank you all um, for joining us today. And I think I'll turn it back over to uh, Joe to see if there were any questions. All right, Derek, thanks. Uh, before we move on to Q&A, just a reminder to the audience that there's still time to submit questions, and you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. 
Well, the first question up is, what programming languages do you think are most valuable for data managers to learn, and is that changing? Uh, I would say the most important languages right now are going to be SAS and R, uh, for data managers specifically. Uh, Python is in the running, but Python is very much is way more useful in a data science type atmosphere where you're trying to you're doing algorithm creation. So if you'd have asked me that question three years ago, I would have said SAS, and then as a distant second and third, I would have said R and Python. But there have been a number of really great R packages lately that have that have been developed and are still being worked on that are actually really good for the kind of data wrangling activities that data management's going to engage in. Um, data transformation is kind of the name of the game, so I would put SAS as a preference because SAS is the baseline for which you can speak to many other groups across organizations right now. Uh, that being said, I am, you know, in my spare time, I'm getting trained in R just to make sure that I can speak both because there's no doubt that object-oriented programming languages are on the rise. That being said, without a background in more data science specialization, specifically computer science, uh, Python is probably less applicable than R would be. So that's the, the long-winded answer uh, of my basically saying I would focus on SAS as far as its its accessibility uh, and its its use its common use among organizations. The pitfall of SAS is that it is very expensive, and if you do not have it at your you know personal machine at your day job, it is it is hideously expensive to maintain on its own. R, on the other hand. Every biostatistician that's coming out of college now, some of them don't even know SAS. They're doing most of their data wrangling and analysis in R, and on top of it, R is free. So if you want to be able to talk to the quote-unquote cool kids, I think in the next few years, I think R is going to be a necessity. Uh, what other qualifications are you looking for in hiring new data managers? Uh, the first one, hands down, is a willingness to learn new things and a genuine enthusiasm for that process. Uh, I will take a, an, an enthusiastic, ready-to-fail employee, and, you know, I will, I will take that person five days a week. That, those are the kinds of employees that are not going to be discouraged and abandoned learning new things and picking up new you know, picking up new skills and, and tool acumen. Uh, I, I really do think those that are, that are properly motivated will be able to find a way to work it into their day-to-day -day and not get discouraged because this is going to be a big leap for a majority of data managers that have been used to working and that have been. Some may have been working for decades in this industry where they started in paper systems and then moved to EDC systems, which despite that being a large technical change, it really wasn't a change from how we handle data capture. So that was a very stable transition. Even the forms on an EDC page look like paper forms. So with the advent of kind of, you know, again, these multidimensional data formats and a variety of data structures, that willingness to really dig in and self-teach in moments where there isn't a clear path forward, I think is the biggest strong suit that anybody could bring to the table as far as, you know, moving into this new kind of citizen data scientist role. Derek, uh, what sort of training would you recommend for people currently in traditional data management roles that would help them through this transition? Uh, I would actually, uh, and I think I, I just briefly touched on them, the data science specializations, uh, the Johns Hopkins data science specialization, specifically on Coursera, is a great course. It's self-paced. Uh, so if you're looking at improving kind of the uh, the, the holistic approach, so not just a programming language, but also how to exec, how to use that, leverage that programming language to do certain tasks and the rationale behind it. I think those are, that is immensely important. Anybody can learn to program, but it is more about an analytical mindset and how you view, you know, disparate data or large data sources and then how you would handle the traditional tasks of data management. So I think a good exercise that I always do if I'm reading new protocols and there's uh, there's a reference in it to, well, we're going to be getting visual analog scale data from an online, from an app. We'll be, you know, prompting them for measurements. Oh, and we'll also collect it in the clinic. 
my initial thoughts are, are there controls on when they can enter the data? Can they enter duplicate data? Is there a, a device setting that will lock them out if they go longer than a week without entering responses? Is there some way that I can mimic that kind of data validation, security, and control that an EDC system provides using multiple methods, using some programmatic, some within the device, and trying to figure out how you would structure that to ensure maximum data quality? So are the data that we get at the end of this trial fit for purpose? Which I think is really the primary role of data management. Uh, and in addition to the one Johns Hopkins course, uh, uh, Data Camp has a few amazing courses. And again, if you're not, you're looking for something a little bit more robust than just straight up learning a new programming language and then figuring out how to work that into your day to day, those would be my two primary recommendations. All right, Derek, it looks like this question will be our last question. Uh, audience member asks, what is the best data cleaning program? Well, the best data cleaning program is usually the one you write yourself. Um, most of the off-the-shelf uh, kind of data monitoring or data visualization tools require a really heavy amount of standardized data to use effectively. Uh, you can't just drop in raw data into most of these tools and, and, and use them. So I think, tactically speaking, if you have a question you need answered or you have a potential risk to your clinical data, always the best option are small compartmentalized checks or programs that basically serve that purpose and that purpose only. So that's a little bit, I mean, everybody has, I mean, there are, you know, Medidata, all the major EDC systems are coming out with new analytical tools that are supposed to help mine for errors. But that process can be extremely herky. It deals largely just with the data that you capture in EDC and getting a bunch of data from a variety of formats and sources and transfer schedules into one of these large-scale sponsored analytics platforms is incredibly difficult. And I think that's why we are seeing the rise of these kind of data analyst, data operations positions is because that need is best filled by folks who understand clinical data and also have the programming chops to match. All right, Derek, I'm going to try and squeeze one more question in. Do you have any advice for a master's level biostatistician moving into data management? Uh, well, I would, I would probably have a couple follow-up questions um, to that, that question, um, especially uh, if you were a master's level in biostatistics, then you are incredibly well primed to move into this, to these kind of these citizen data scientist roles. And the only limiting factor potentially would be, um, again, like, a program, like programming languages, like what are you maximally familiar with? Um, I think in that position, there, as there are more and more uh, biostatisticians that are coming out of bachelor's and master's degree programs that have never touched SAS, I think one of the key pieces is going to be maintaining some balance between a uh, standard kind of uh, pseudocode or something like SAS versus object-oriented languages to be able to figure out how to leverage R's kind of superior data visualization capabilities and web interface versus SAS is tried and true. Everybody speaks this language. It produces a consistent result, and everybody understands this. So I think in a way, anybody with a, with a biostatistics background is going to be really well-placed to not only handle the conceptual tasks of data management, but also how to execute them from a practical perspective if they keep their, their programming acumen, you know, in shape and that they continue to grow and develop. All right, it looks like uh, that'll wrap up our Q&A session. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this Fierce Markets webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd also like to thank our speaker for participating and Roe for presenting the webinar. Just a reminder to the audience, the webinar has been recorded, and you will be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Again, thank you for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.